Wonderful. Thank you so much, Britann. I sincerely appreciate this introduction. And thank you to everyone for spending your time here today discussing how to interpret the GI360. And I know we have we've been working with stool testing and the GI360 in particular. So I look forward to this enriching conversation today. So let's begin. Here we are going to start with the first page of the GI360. This portion of the report provides a wealth of information. We're going to dive right in here to, to the report. So the first page of the GI360 starts with the web. The web is a visual representation of your patient's abundance and diversity. This is a unique aspect here because this is really where the research and a uh, body of information that we have about the microbiome meets clinical practice is right here at this web. So the web tells us where your patient's results are on the normobiotic reference range. And real quick, I just wanna explain the way GI360 was developed. It's a little bit unique compared to other stool tests on the market. And there is a thought right now about how do we understand normal microbiome? How do we define the normal microbiota? And that's very important, right? So the way GI360 was developed was Instead of looking at all the bacteria that we can identify in the human microbiome, they started with healthy populations as the controls and then conditions. So individuals that had IBS, IBD, obesity, diabetes, and then they looked at the microbiota, the profiles of those individuals. And that information is what you see here. So the healthy individuals have this white hexagonal microbiome. There's no dysbiosis, and then there's healthy diversity. So that's what you want your patient to be on that normobiotic reference range. So right away, again, to begin, we're looking at your patient's web that says their microbiome abundance and diversity on the normobiotic reference range by phyla. And you will hear these six main phyla over and over again in clinical practice and in research. This is well-established the actinobacteria, the verruca microba, the tunicutes, proteobacteria, firmicutes, and bacteroidetes. So we can see here right now for this patient as an example that the actinobacteria phyla is pulled in towards the center. So that shows lower abundance of that phyla. Where the point of that hexagon plots along that phyla line is the value. So actinobacteria is a little bit lower, Veruca microbe is within range, Turnicutes is within range, and Proteobacteria is within range. So it's important that we understand how to read this graph here. So for this patient, we would say, you know, moderates, abundance looks healthy, it's not teeny tiny pulled in. Diversity looks reasonable as well because it's approximating a hexagon. Sometimes you'll see this is a triangle, it's a square, uh, and then you have serious issues with diversity. So that's where we begin for this patient. And then we'll move along. <clears throat> the GI360 starts with this broad-based phyla information, and then each piece of information becomes more and more detailed. The next piece of information we have is the dysbiosis score. Scores go from one to five. And then remember, we talked about the condition. So IBS, IBD, obesity, diabetes, those are associated with the dysbiotic gut. Those are going to be the scores of four and five. So one and two is a healthy gut, and then three is that moderate gut there. And then for diversity is quite interesting because you would be remiss to read a study about the microbiome and diversity and not see that there's a connection between gut microbiome diversity and almost every physiologic health implication. I will say there are studies with regards to immune function, including response to COVID. There's studies with regards to cardiovascular disease. Um, diabetes, extroverted behavior, so, so many different factors. And then, of course, within the human colon, we do like diversity. Diversity is a nuanced topic, though, because you can see diverse colons with some path pathogenic colons, such as IBD and IBS. But broadly speaking, you want higher diversity. So the score four or five is healthy in the colon. It's similar to any ecosystem where you want a diverse, rich ecosystem. So that's the first piece of information here. And again, you can get a lot of information from just this very first section. And these are very patient-friendly teaching tools. 
And again, the dysbiosis score, like I had mentioned, this was originally studied with over 1,000 subjects. And now I believe there's over 5,000 subjects. And the data continues to be collected. So we're constantly looking at this data, constantly evaluating it, validating it as well. So with GI 360, you can access all of those research papers at www.gi360.com. So everything is available to you. Okay. And then diversity, if you just put uh, information about microbiome diversity into PubMed, there's, I believe, 14,000 papers right now. So there'll be more and more coming, actually. So that's the first section of GI360. And that's PCR. That's looking at the bacteria in a profile that is associated with health and specifically conditions. Then the next piece of GI360 we're going to talk about is culture. So GI360 includes PCR and culture. That's important because you want both pieces of information. With the PCR data that we've been talking about, that's very important to understand a profile of the microbiome. Additionally, with the PCR, that is the best way to identify a pathogen. If you're looking for a virus, you want PCR because you can't culture it. It's not a, you can't culture it. It's not a bacteria. If you're looking for parasites or a bacteria associated with gastroenteritis, you want PCR. You want that very sensitive and specific marker. So we're including that in GI360. But then there's another category of bacteria, and that's the dysbiotic bacteria. We're going to provide culture for those bacteria. We're going to provide culture in that way. You can find out other bacteria that are inhabiting your patient's microbiome that may not be associated with that profile that we discussed, and it may not be associated with pathogenic gastroenteritis, right? So that's culture. The cool thing about GI360 is that it includes this Maldetoff technology. So we're going to culture the bacteria that are growing in your patient's sample and then use that Maldetoff, this latest technology, to identify the bacteria. This is an open-ended library system that is connected worldwide. So be rest assured that the bacteria will be identified in your patient's sample. And again, the cool thing is about GI360 is that it has both. So it has that culture. It's like you're fishing, you're casting a wide net, and you're just catching whatever flora you can find. And then it has that PCR. So looking for targeted pathogenic bacteria, and then looking for targeted bacteria that are associated with that microbiome abundance and diversity information. Okay. Here we see a sample of the pathogens panel. These are the 11 common causes of acute gastroenteritis. So we're looking for three viruses. We're looking for those pathogenic bacteria. And then we're looking for three parasites. This is for your patient that walks in with acute onset gastroenteritis of unknown origin. And PCR is the appropriate methodology in those cases. Additionally, GI360 includes parasitology for over 30 parasites. This is via Olbaum parasitology. So this is the expert parasitologist looking at that three-day sample under the microscope, and that is still the standard of care for parasitology. Um, so GI360 is including both PCR and Olbaum parasitology for parasites. So that's very important because we are including both methodologies. Additionally, looking under the microscope, we're looking for other markers. So this provides additional information, red blood cells, white blood cells, and then the digestive markers, muscle fibers, vegetable fibers, charcoal laden crystals, pollen. Additionally, the macroscopic appearance. So the color, consistency, mucus, all of that is important criteria as well. So all of that is included. We're going to take a moment to talk about culturomics because GI360 does include culturomics. This is still the gold standard in microbiology. So it still is. There's so much information and talk about PCR, and that's excellent. But culturomics is still the gold standard for microbiology. This allows us to identify unique organisms. Remember, I said it's like we're casting a net. And sometimes there are new bacteria discovered. A few years back, there was a brand new bacteria that doctors data discovered called the Lariobacter Hong Kong Genesis. So that was neat. This allows us to identify over 300 species of yeast, of which 95 are candida. So that's why it needs to be updated, because as you'll see here, we're able to identify and speciate greater and greater, and that Maldetoff library is updated every one to two years. 
So the multi-top library does have a reference library of over 1,500 genera and species of bacteria and fungi. So wealth of bacteria and fungi there. Here's an example of that page, that microbiology page. In that page, you will see different categories. So the first category will be pathogenic bacteria. We'll take a look at that. But then you'll see imbalanced bacteria. And this is a perfect opportunity for individualized medicine. This is your patient's result. And then no two pages will look the same. You're going to see those pathogenic bacteria, those imbalanced bacteria, and then you'll see the yeast. So with regards to the imbalanced bacteria, you can have anything from zero to about a dozen here, and that's really considered within normal limits. If those bacteria are outside the reference interval, if they fall into dysbiotic, that would be another category of dysbiotic bacteria. For the dysbiotic bacteria and dysbiotic yeast, we provide direct susceptibilities via natural and pharmaceutical agents. And the great thing is that is your patient's isolate. This is not anything that's on a wall chart. So this is your patient's isolate. And we're taking that isolate and we are providing direct information in vitro regarding the sensitivities of the agents. So you have that at the end of the report to guide your treatment. And again, this is the Maldi Toff page, the culture page. Here you see those sensitivities. So for this example, for this candida, you see the natural and then the antifungals there. And again, this is directly to your patient's isolate. This is not from a wall chart. We didn't reference this somewhere. This is taking those isolates directly in the lab with the agents and reporting that data to you. At the end of GI360, you will see that there is commentary for your patient's results. So GI360 is a wealth of information, but rest assured, at the end, you will have specific commentary that is associated with strictly your patient's results. Now, sometimes the questions get asked about which profile to order. I would recommend starting with the GI360. As you can see here, the GI360 includes each section of the report. So that's that microbiome abundance and diversity portion. That's the first section that we saw that talks about the profiles, the dysbiosis index, the diversity score, and then you actually will get functional guilds. GI360 is looking at about 45 bacterial andalites that are associated with a healthy microbiome and an unhealthy microbiome, a dysbiotic microbiome. But then we are actually taking it into more detailed information and we're looking at specific bacteria associated with function. So the bacteria that are associated with butyrate production, that mucosal barrier integrity, inflammation, the balance between the opportunistic versus the gut barrier protective. So we are really detailing that information for you. So that's included in the GI360 and then all of the reports, that PCR, microbiome abundance and diversity information. And then GI360 also includes, like I said, that pathogen panel. And then you can also find that in the essentials. And then the parasitology is in both tests as well as the culture. Now, what, uh, one test that we didn't quite look at yet is stool chemistries and beta glucuronidase. That's in the full GI360. So that's why I recommend you start there. And then you can go ahead and use the other test to reorder. So you can order smaller profiles to recheck. Okay. So again, I would recommend starting with the full GI360 and then pretend potentially on the positive findings, what you want to reorder, you can make an adjustment there. All right. So now let's take a look at some cases because I'm sure this is where... I'm just going to check the Q&A real quick to see if there's any methodology questions. Oh, I'll just say real quick, charcoal laden crystals associated with parasitology. So that's a finding, eosinophils and parasitology. So you will potentially see that in your patients with parasitology. The other thing I will just say is that pollen sometimes is an incidental finding or it may be associated with allergies. So those are some questions that come up. And then while I'm going to go on to the cases now, I will mention with GI360, if you ever have a question about methodology, if you ever think, am I looking at PCR? Am I looking at culture? The bottom left-hand corner of the page will always tell you what the methodology of that page is. So that's a good key there. Okay, so now let's take a look at some cases. I'm gonna. All right. 
So our first case is a 23-year-old female, history of the GI complaints of unknown origin, and then the um, gastro, she's been referred from her primary care doctor to a gastroenterologist, and that has been determined within normal limits. The gastroenterologist said, you're fine. The patient is on a standard American diet, and I'm sure you've seen these patients in your practice, these young individuals, sometimes pretend to be female, dominant with these significant GI complaints of unknown origin without any uh, relief. So let's take a look at the GI 360 for this patient. Again, we're going to start with this very first page here. So the first page is the web. So take a look at that web there. You can see that it is not making a hexagon. This shape is very lopsided, very low. And this, the first thing I look at is this actinobacteria phyla clinical pearl here. They really like vegetables and soluble fiber. So I would think there about the patient's intake of vegetables and soluble fiber. Remember, the patient's on the standard American diet. Baruch and microba are too high. Deuteronikides. And then the proteobacteria, the clinical pearl here for the proteobacteria, is a very inflammatory phyla there. And they really like excess fats, excess protein, and processed foods, standard American diets. So that, that's what I see here, really. And then the Firmicutes and the Bacteroidetes are a little bit lower. Really not clear clinical pearls for those phyla, but I am thinking in the back of my mind about the diet. Now, this section, abundance and diversity in that first section, that microbiome section of GI360, is really diet-driven, right? Because the bacteria in our colon are dependent on the food that we feed them as the substrates for their energy source. So in this case, um, sometimes people like to say, they look at that first section, they think, what can I kill? What can you kill comes later in the report. So that's the pathogens and that's the dysbiotic bacteria. Does that make sense? Okay. So for this patient, we can see her dysbiosis index score is five. So if this is a young patient. She has a dysbiosis index score of five. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking about risk for chronic disease, IBS, IBD, metabolic conditions, things like that. So we want to help this patient get back to uh, baseline. And then same thing for diversity. Diversity is one, so that's a very low score. This is a standard American diet-induced dysbiotic gut that has low diversity. So we really want to help this patient. The next piece of information I see here is the key findings. There's two columns in key findings. The way you want to look at this, that first column is, again, this is detailed information about the microbiome. I'm going to re re repeat myself. We start with the phyla. Then we're going into these computed algorithmic scores, and then we're looking at the bacteria by specific functional guilds. These are groups of bacteria that function in the same matter for this outcome. So the butyrate producers here are too low. We want to feed the butyrate producers. The soluble fiber feeding approach is the best approach. That's going to be, I'm just trying to think, because it's the soluble fiber recommendations have increased. So for women, I would say 10 to 15 grams of soluble fiber per day, men 15 to 20. So this person's probably getting, I'm going to just guess, on standard American diet, probably about two. She needs to be at 10 to 15 grams of soluble fiber per day. Go low and slow. Do not go too fast, okay? Next piece of information we have is the gut barrier protective bacteria. Those are within range. Okay, great. We're not thinking about intestinal permeability. Okay, good. That's great. Next thing is the gut intestinal health marker so that the healthy bacteria that decrease inflammation in the colon are too low. So again, we want to feed them soluble fiber. You could also think about inflammatory components. I look at the second one as well, the pro-inflammatory bacteria. These are too high. So again, this is a diet-induced dysbiotic situation with elevated pro-inflammatory bacteria. So it's going to be the diet is going to be the consideration. But you could do something else to help the colon to soothe it, whatever you consider. There's many options, olive oil, glutamine, chamomile, so many different things. So that's your choice, but that's an option as well. And then the balance between those gut barrier protective versus opportunistic bacteria. So we know that there's too high of those opportunistic bacteria and too low of the positive ones. That makes sense. We're just going to intensify our strategies. The next piece of information we see is that the butyrate is too low. So the butyrate producers are too low and then the butyrate is too low. We want to support that. Nothing new here. We're just going to intensify the uh, strategies. 
And then total short-chain fatty acids are too low. So when butyrate is too low, the patient could have more inflammation in the colon because butyrate does go on to feed the colonocytes. Butyrate is also a microbial mediator to systemic physiology. So we definitely want to help this patient. But the nice thing is there's things we can do. And the thing is here, it's a great example to see really how diet plays a significant role with regards to the microbiome and how the standard American diet is just not great. Now let's take a look at her um, stool chemistries. We're going to flip to the stool chemistries for her. Digestion absorption looks healthy. So her elastase is very healthy. Fat stains is healthy. Carbohydrates, all of that's healthy within range. Inflammatory markers look very good. So that makes sense, right? She had that gastroenterologist workup. Usually that's what they're looking for is these markers. Lactoferrin, lysis on calprotectin within range. Great. I would take a look at the IgA on the lower end of the reference interval, 37.2. I would think about the precursors. Precursors here would be vitamin A, vitamin D, and zinc. If she's on the standard American diet, she's probably low in those anyways. So that's going to be something to take a look at and address via supplementation, diet, whatever you decide. Short-chain fatty acids. We said that the butyrate is lower, the totals are lower. So we do want to feed this patient really soluble fiber. Again, go low and slow for somebody who's not been on soluble fiber. She just doesn't have the bacteria to take that in as a substrate. And so the patient can feel worse when you get, if you give them too much at one time. And we do not want that, right? Okay. So that was the standard American diet. Let's take a look at our second case. Second case, similar presentation, 26-year-old female, history of GI disturbances of unknown origin. So it looks the same, but are we going to treat them because they present the same. No, we're going to take a look at the GI 360. This patient suspects intestinal permeability. She's heard about this. So leaky gut is a popular terminology these days, but we can help our patients and take a look, right? So looking at her GI 360, what do we see here? We see a different web. Actinobacteria is, is lower. Ver so again, vegetables, Veruca microba is lower. Veruca microba one of the important bacterium there I like to think about is the Acromantia mucinophila, a very popular bacteria. Now I'm thinking of that in the back of my head because the patient said intestinal permeability. Acromantia really plays a significant role when it comes to mucosal barrier integrity. So that's an important consideration. But we need more info. Let's take a look. Dysbiosis is three, diversity is three. So this is moderate. I would say there's things to do. And right off the back of my head, I'm thinking about Vegetable consumption, polyphenols as well. Okay, so key findings. Her butyrate producers are too low. So again, this patient needs butyrate producing substrates, soluble fiberphene approach, gut barrier protected bacteria. So the gut barrier protected bacteria are too low and that's gonna be the acromantia, the ruminococcus. So we wanna support them. So, uh, polyphenols are going to be war warranted. There is no recommended dose of polyphenols but studies have shown that one to two grams per day is associated with decreased risk of developing chronic disease. So that's a consideration. The gut barrier intestinal health marker is too low. So again, I would think about supporting that. Um, Pro-inflammatory bacteria are within range. This is not the same condition we saw previously in the colon. And then that balance between the gut barrier protective versus opportunistic is too low. So I am thinking with the gut barrier protective bacteria, when they get too low, that can precede intestinal permeability. So that's what we're thinking about. Let's take a look at the next piece of information. We see the C. diff toxin. We'll talk about that in a minute. Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates in the colon are a sign of intestinal permeability. So the carbohydrates in the gut barrier protective, I would probably consider uh, supporting mucosal barrier integrity right now and thinking about intestinal permeability. You could follow up with the serum zonulin to get the absolute values. Um, fecal zonulin is available as well. IgA is low. That's another clue that there's intestinal permeability. And then her beta glucuronidase is too high. So again, she needs that soluble fiber. She needs those vegetables. And I would think about estrogen, maybe follow up with the Humap, uh, salivary hormone testing for this patient. I would do that as well. So a few things we can work on here. Okay. So for her, again, I just want to take a look under the hood of those bacteria. Fecal bacteria pregnancia is too low. We really want to add the soluble fiber. The ruminococcus species is too high. That does make me think about intestinal permeability issues. And then just a moment here for the pathogens. 
again, these pathogens are for the common causes of acute gastroenteritis. Now, she has chronic GI conditions. She does not have an acute condition. With, with that finding, I would consider that this is asymptomatic carrier status or potentially she has a resolved infection of C. diff. But she does not present with, that's not her chief complaint, acute gastroenteritis. About 30% of the population is asymptomatic carrier for C. difficile, and that is potentially associated with community-acquired immunity. So with the GI pathogens panel, this page here, this is page five of the report. If your patient's symptomatic, great, you can treat them. If they're not symptomatic, you don't necessarily need to treat them. Okay. Because again, PCR is very sensitive and specific. It can still pick up the DNA or the RNA if the infection has resolved. So case two here, we're taking a look at the stool chemistries. Her digestion absorption looks very healthy. Her inflammatory markers look healthy. IgA is definitely low. So we're going to use, again, vitamin A, vitamin D, zinc. For this case, we're thinking about intestinal permeability. So I'm thinking about all those other things like glutamine, marshmallow, things like that. And then that beta glucuronidase is too high, but her short chain fatty acids look good. Okay, so our third case is a 37 year old male who has a history of IBD. And you might see this case in your clinic. Individuals who have a history of IBD are utilizing the ketogenic diet as a therapy. So let's take a look at the colon. <clears throat> All right, so for the web, we see, a, I would say, a decreased abundance. You can see how it's pulled in. So there's lower bacteria here. And the first thing that I see is this proteobacteria, this inflammatory group of bacteria. Again, they like excess fats and excess proteins, which are part of the ketogenic diet. <clears throat> there is a dysbiosis in x score of four, so this, this is a dysbiotic gut, and there's low diversity. That makes sense, right? The vac These phyla are lower, and then it's skewed toward the proteo, so that is a lower diversity colon. Let's get some more information here. Um, so when we look at the functional guilds, they are all outside the reference interval. So every single category of functional bacteria is outside the reference interval. And then when we look at the short-chain fatty acids, we have what's called short-chain fatty acid imbalance. So we have too high and we have too low. They're imbalanced. Again, the short-chain fatty acids are directly derived from those bacteria. So the food of the ketogenic diet is creating a dysbiotic low diversity colon with these functional guilds outside their reference interval. And then the product is that those short chain fatty acids are imbalanced. So we need to take it back all the way to the diet. Total short chain fatty acids are low. The beta glucuronidase is lower. That's interesting. There's no clinical association with low beta glucuronidase. It may be associated with that low diversity. So there's some studies that show that low diversity will end up with low beta glucuronidase. Nothing to do there, though, to treat that. There is occult blood here. So occult blood on GI 360 denotes an upper, it's blood that's been hemolyzed. So it's upper GI bleeding. That's what you would think. But in people that are on the ketogenic diet or carnivore diet, we do see occult blood, and that's just a byproduct of the diet. But in any case, you could rerun this in four weeks just to be sure that there isn't like an ulcer, esophageal varices, something like that. And then there are two, there's a Klebsiella and a Proteus cultured. Okay, let's take a look here. For the bacteria, just a note here, this acromancia, do you see this within the Veruca microba is too low? So the patient needs polyphenols. And then the proteobacteria and the Escherichiae are too high. These are inflammatory bacteria and they love. So this is, you can see here, the patient's consuming excess fats and proteins. So those proteo and those Escherichiae are thriving. But then the bacteria that like the polyphenols are depleted. So again, diet-induced dysbiosis. All right. And then for the stool chemistries for this patient, we see that digestion absorption looks healthy. No signs of inflammation yet, so that's good. Secretary IG looks healthy, but then we see that short-chain fatty acid imbalance. Now take a note that we are absolutely measuring the value um, of butyrate, but then we're looking at the percentage of butyrate. It's just outside the reference interval for the balance. But then the total short chain fatty acids are still frankly low. So the patient is still low in total short chain fatty acids. And then the lower beta glucuronidase, nothing to do there. Occult blood, standard of care is to follow up again in four weeks. All right. 
And then the last thing we have here is for the cultured Klebsiella and the Proteus, we do have the agents. And again, this is the isolate that was in your patient's sample taken directly in the lab, and you can see what treats what is effective. So you have caprylic acid, uva ursi, and then you have uva ursi. Caprylic acid is moderate, so those would be good options. And then you have you could use every antibiotic except for ampicillin, really. So you want to use one that hits both, right? So if you have multiple bacteria, multiple yeast, you'd like to use something that will address both. Okay. All right. So in conclusion, GI 360 is combining the methodologies. Like we said, we're combining that PCR-based molecular testing and culturomics. We're providing a standardized test to profile the microbiome, identify dysbiosis and pathogens, including parasites. GI360 also includes that state-of-the-art stool chemistry analysis, as we've seen, and susceptibility testing to guide treatment. This provides a standardized test to profile the microbiome and clinically actionable results. All right. So let's take a look at the Q&A here. I know we had some questions. Um, so I will mention that one of the questions that was submitted previously was the question about the J pouch. And the question was, if your patient has had a J pouch, could we utilize the GI360? Yes, you can. We have seen that when samples are taken from that J pouch, it tends to take up, it tends to make up the microbiome. We have seen a similar profile in that pouch. Now, we technically, we're not going to guarantee any results from a sample outside the microbiome, but I can tell you that we have seen where that, that J pouch really does, that environment, that ecosystem does tend to resemble the microbiome. So we've seen it very closely resemble the microbiome. All right, excuse me. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the questions here. Um, let's see. Yeah, so GI 360 is a great question, a great, great one to choose. All right. Charcoal-laden crystals, anti-gluten antibodies. Can we add on? We do not offer that. We offer a special. We offer a finger prick and a serum test for gluten sensitivity and celiac testing. So that's a different test. The next question is: Does the test include acromancia and short-chain fatty acids? Yes, it does. Can you comment on massive DNA sequencing versus PCR for the microbiome benefits of PCR? So I believe massive DNA, se DNA sequences is something like shotgun genomic sequencing versus PCR. Yeah, there is every type of testing has its place. I would say their shotgun genomic sequences makes sense in regards to looking at all of the bacteria within the human colon. But then the GI360 has taken that profile. GI360 has taken that profile and looking at the specific bacteria that are associated with a health and looking at the bacteria that are associated with the conditions, like I mentioned, IBS, IBD, things of that nature. And so that is different. PCR, the benefits of PCR, like I said, it's very sensitive and specific with regards to that, with that pathogens portions of the test, and then also with the microbial abundance and diversity portion of the test. Now, the other consideration is the limit of that is that, again, it's like you're fishing with a specific lure. You have a, a bait and you're looking just for that organism. That's why we're including the culture in it as well, because the culture, you can identify a variety of bacteria on there. Okay. The next question is for the occult blood, which tasks do you run at four weeks? For that, it's the GUIAC test. So you can order that through us, or you can also probably get that through your medical supplier or something like that, the, occult, the GUIAC test. And that's because the occult blood test, again, it's going to be upper, it's hemolyzed, it's from the upper GI. In that case, that you just want to confirm because it can be from diet, it can be from cause large amounts of vitamin C, things like that. So you just want to be confirmatory. And then what does susceptibility testing example with berberine doesn't mean that berberine is effective or ineffective. So susceptibility testing means you, let me go back to this. So hi, and that's the second question. Yeah. Excuse me. 
So the higher sensitivities mean that these are effectively it killed the agent in the it killed the isolate in the petri dish. So example for the proteus right here, the uva ursi did that, caprylic acid did it, olive leaf did, but then the others did not. All of these prescriptive agents did. And then for the Klebsiella, all the prescriptive agents except the ampicillin did. So you want to choose the high sensitivities. Good question. So we had two questions about that. So high versus low pH. I would say with regards to pH, you, um, with regards to pH, you will see other findings. You're not just going to see a pH outside of reference interval and no other findings. It's really has to do with the bacteria there, whether there is a pathogen present, if there's a food sensitivity, all of that will influence whether this stool is acidic or alkaline. So you'll see the other findings there and you'll address accordingly. So the pH is integral to the, to the microenvironment of the colon. Okay, based on what you're saying. Okay, so the question says, based on what you were saying, we are not seeing every microbe, just those with scientific research for good, bad. So yes and no. Okay, so for the GI360, that's why GI360 includes both parts. So that PCR portion with that microbiome abundance and diversity, those are bacteria that are associated with, those are bacteria that are associated with health. So with, the, with that profile, they're associated with healthy, normal biotic reference ranges. Those are the controls. And then the other individuals are associated with IBS, IBD, et cetera. So those bacteria are associated with that. And then this kind of goes with the other question in terms of shotgun genomic sequencing and things like that. So this is, both questions are the same. So it's a broad-based question. So I'm just going to go a little bit back. Historically, the way that we looked at what bacteria were in the human colon was culture. That was the way to do it. That was the technology. That's how we understand we're culturing what's going on within the human colon. And that's the way it's been done. And then there are some nuances with culture, right? Because th there's anaerobic, there's aerobic. GI360 is doing both. So you have that information there. And then along came the advent of DNA technology. And with DNA technology, that's excellent, right? And so the nice thing about DNA technology is that we can identify a lot of different bacteria now that we didn't potentially identify before. But at the end of the day, what does that bacteria mean for your patient? I personally think shotgun genomic sequencing is, is, is excellent in research, but in terms of taking that information and bringing it to the forefront of clinical applicability, it's just not quite there yet. Because you can tell me that your patient has XYZ bacteria but at the end of the day, what does it mean for their health? And so that's the neat thing about GI360 is all of that information has been done. They started with the shotgun genomic sequencing. They started with looking at all of the bacteria within the human colon and then making a profile that determines a healthy gut versus the normal biotic reference range versus a dysbiotic gut. And so that information has already been done for you. That's the, the interesting thing about the time we're living in right now is that the DNA technology can provide us a wealth of information, but at the end of the day, what do you do about that bacteria and how does it change your patient's health? So that's the same thing. Okay, let me see here. Okay, about histamine intolerance. We don't have any specific profiles associated with histamine. But yeah, I think that with regards to histamine issues, microbiome information is very help helpful. Okay, the next question is, has the test been expanded since 2020 as there seems more than more info than my full test, i.e. recommendations for pathogens? No, the pathogen recommendation is really standard of care. Really, that's going to be antibiotics or oral rehydration therapy where needed. The pathogens, there's nothing new with that. The one caveat I would say is chronic C. difficile infection and that's just ongoing really fecal microbial transplant is the place to look there and that's where we, or we may see something but nothing quite yet yeah do you think of a specific mineral deficiency when bacteriotis is too low nothing specifically with regards to minerals it's a good question okay and then are the prescriptive and natural agents always the same for each pathogen so the prescriptive and yes so they, the, as you see them listed here, the natural agents, the prescriptive agents, this is what we have. We have a set for bacteria. 
And then we have a set for yeast, okay? So that's on there. So I'm going to go up and see if there's any more questions. Okay. Do you see different diets having an effect on the microbiome? For instance, would the microbiome standard American diet look different from Mediterranean, keto, carnivore versus vegan? Okay, that's a great question. As you could see with that patient that we had with the standard American diet, that was a dysbiotic gut. And then we saw the ketogenic diet, we also saw a dysbiotic gut. So I would say yes. I would say in patients that are on these diets, carnivore, ketogenic, low-fat, even paleo diets, I would definitely consider taking a look at their gut microbiome and addressing. Now, yeah, so that's a, a new area. And I would say with that, I would definitely recommend looking at your patient's colons. I will tell you what, we have seen patients that are on these fad diets, just ketogenic and carnivore diets with significant dysbiosis. And then on the carnivore diet, we have seen some patients with those inflammatory markers, lactoferrin, calprotectin. Lysozyme. So I would definitely run this test on patients that are on those diets. Okay. Excuse me. I'm just taking a look at the questions. Are the butyrate producing bacteria the ones that we link to ser producing serotonin? Yes and no. And then there's some information there with regards to microbiome diversity. So yeah, that's a good question with regards to the the major producers. Okay, so I believe those are the questions. We do not offer the eosinophilic protein X. We do have those, again, the markers of the um, immunology marker IgA. So that's the marker that we have there. And I'll just check the chat to see. Excuse me, I'm just looking through the chat. I think that there's some information in the chat that is not necessarily questions for the test for GI360 test. Okay, great. Are there any other questions about the GI360 or any other questions about, yeah, the testing, when to, when to order or collection? I will mention collection question that comes up often. The question is, the test is a three-day collection method. And that is really because of the parasitology, because, excuse me, the parasitology is a three-day sample. So you're supposed to collect over three different days based on the parasitology, that's standard of care. If you're not doing that or you don't want that information for your patients, you can just have your patient collect on one day. So sometimes that's easier for people. They can collect from one sample. In that case, you're going to use, there's three vials. There's a white, a yellow, and a black cat vial. You, you will not get any different information. The only difference is going to be on your parasitology page. It's going to say samples collected. It will say one, two, or three. So in that case, it will say samples collected one, that's one day, versus samples collected three, that's a three-day sample. So that's a good option. And then, let's see here, another question is that if the patient's on, so a lot of patients are on, uh, medications or PPIs, or sometimes they are on stool softeners, things like that. So I would just say the recommended laxative is going to be um, psyllium husk, magnesium, or oral fleet. So when the patients are on that, they can take the GI360. If they're on like a Miralax or something like that, you need to be off of that because that can potentially inhibit the testing. And the other thing is sometimes patients can't get off of their probiotics or you don't want them off their probiotics, that's your choice. It is recommended to be off the probiotic for two weeks because that will show us the native microbiome. So once the patient's off the probiotic for two weeks, that will show us what their microbiome looks like. Otherwise, if they've been on the probiotic within that two-week period, potentially that's some of the information that we're receiving. And you can do that if you want to take a look at the efficacy of the probiotic. So that's your choice as well. Okay. And then with regards to medication, sometimes that comes up too. If the patient's on a medication or a supplement, can we do the test? Yes. It is your choice as the ordering physician regarding medications and supplements. At the end of the day, that is your clinical decision. With the colon, there's not a lot of testing with regards to how XYZ medication affects this colonic parameter. We're going to get that information as we go along. It's another piece of information. I do see there may be more questions here. 
Oh, probiotics, right? So the recommendation is two weeks off probiotics. Um, and then, let me see. So what do you think about the fact that the stool is not homogenous? A sample taken from one area is quite different from the other end. So when you do the sample, you are supposed to collect from different areas around the, the stool. Yep. So that's true. Okay. And then the question is, I had another doctor tell me these tests aren't useful because the microbiome is constantly changing hour and won't be the same necessarily after the test. So that's a great point. There is some variability with the microbiome but there is some consistency as well. And so that's what we're really looking at here is the consistency. It's a very nuanced topic, but we could say the microbiome kind of does develop at birth and then within the first few years of our life. So it's, there is a, a section, a um, portion of it, a certain extent that's set via the beginning of our life. So think about that concept that if you're born via um, C-section or you're born via vaginal birth, that does play a role with your health. And that has a lot to do with the way the microbiome is laid. Same things with regards to nursing and then the lifelong considerations with regards to um, allergies and asthma and things like that. The microbiome is static and it is dynamic and it does change but there, it does remain the same. And so that's the point of the testing with GI360 is you do have this profile that has been proven to consistently show with regards to those reports. And then I will say, if you're going to understand the microbiome with regards to systemic physiology, there are agreed upon parameters such as the, like those phyla, right? And there's agreed upon parameters such as specific keystone bacteria, like Acromanthia mucinophila or fecal bacteria carnitiae or lactobacillus or bacteria disease. So there are agreed upon parameters. So yeah, it's the this testing can be very helpful clinically. And then avoid digestive enzymes. Yes, you should avoid digestive enzymes one week. Does the collection have to be three days in a row? Ideally. So the consideration is that you do want it to be as consistent as possible just for the stability of the sample. So if you are doing the parasitology collection, there's a formative in there right away that will kill the parasites. If you're doing the, the culture, you're going to put that in the freezer. So that's going to be stable, but you want to collect and send to the lab as reasonably within that time frame as possible. So you don't want to have something sitting around for an extended period of time before you send it out to the lab. So that's why it's three days in a row. And then if the patient has a loose watery stool, diarrhea before the test, that's fine. A lot of the patients will have loose stools because they might have a GI complaint and that's why they're doing the test. There's different par parts of the test that we talked about. So actually this, excuse me, the GI pathogens panel, this page is actually, this test is actually made for a loose watery stool because we're looking for very sensitive uh, viruses, pathogenic bacteria, and parasites. But the rest of the report isn't really made for a loose watery stool. So if they had diarrhea before, try to get a homogenous sample as possible. That will help for the test collection. But there's only so much you can do. Okay. And I believe that was all the questions. All right. So thank you, everybody, for your attention. And then if you have any questions, you can put them in here while we're wrapping up. Hi, everyone. We hope you enjoyed this class. If you're a practitioner, make sure you go sign up at rupahealth.com. And if you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe.